Welcome to Croft Life. Today I've got a uh, special guest, uh, Mr. Shemesh. How are you doing, sir? I'm well, thank you very much, Paul. How are you? Uh, not too bad, not too bad. Um, so uh, for the for the people that don't know who you are, um, can you tell us just, um, you know, who you, like who you are, like uh, where, where your studio is uh, right now and where you're out of, based out of right now? Yeah, so um, I'm originally from Israel. Up, uh, you know, born and raised. Um, I moved to New York City about uh, 11 years ago. Um, for the first five years, I worked under uh, my instructor, Gabi Noah. Um, so I represented him and uh, his organization, the IKM, uh, International Krav Maga by Gabi Noah. And um, in 2015, I branched out uh, and started Krav Maga Experts. Four locations in the city and um, we had over a thousand students here. Uh -huh. um, we have uh, an affiliate uh, in Mexico City and uh, in France and uh, uh, on the west coast of the United States. And uh, we've been work we are working internationally um, and I teach instructors courses you know, around the globe as uh, as needed. You know, again, uh -huh. all that pre pre COVID, you know, post COVID, uh, we'll see where the economy goes and what happens. But uh, I'm uh, the the beauty about this, uh, this our studio is uh, that there's enough people here that I don't have to travel, right? Like to, to make my bread and butter, right? Right. So to make a good living, all I have to do is stick around here. Uh, yeah. So everything else is a plus. Everything else is an extra. You know, we get to share the love. We get to to teach people from different countries um, and uh, certified awesome new instructors. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I can tell you that if I didn't have to support, you know, my family and myself, I would have mm -hmm. done it for like yeah. that's, that's how much I love it. I, th I think a lot of instructors are like that. If we could do our job for free, we would. Yeah. Uh, just because we believe in the, in the mission and, and what Krav Maga is and how beneficial it is to other people. Yeah. Um, so is Krav Maga experts... Um, is it an, is it a, are you kind of like an association, a franchise? Are you still under the IKM or are you separate from them? Like how, I'm how is, separate from them. Yeah. you're separate I'm, from them? I separated from them and I still have you know, great friendship with uh, my previous instructors. Um, I'm very close friends with Gabby still. Uh, mm -hmm. Tremendous amount of respect to him as a, as a teacher and also as a friend. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but uh, you know, business is a different thing, right? Like when you have to support your family, you have to do what's, what's right for your family, regardless of uh, you know, politics. So I, uh, I created that brand of Chromeva Experts mm -hmm. um, and uh, just things went very well since. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so let's, let's dig uh, a little bit into your, your past and your history. Mm -hmm. um, did you start in a different martial art and then go to Krav Maga, or did you start just in Krav Maga? So all my life, I've done mostly Krav Maga. I le started learning when I was five. Um, back then, where I used to live, my, where, my, where my parents live, is a, it was super small. It wasn't even a town. It's more like a village, right? And there was like mm -hmm. only a handful of families there. And luckily, one of the, you know, more original instructors uh, learned that one of Imi's students uh, was teaching there. Oh, right? wow. um, that was one of the only uh, after-school programs offered at the at the area, and I was just fortunate enough to be trained, you know, with uh, with the legit people. You know? So it became part of my DNA since. Hmm. And, and and so tell us how. Like, how did that evolve? Like your, your Krav Maga training and your experiences in, in Israel up until the point where you, you came over to the US? So, you know, Krav Maga um, was always something in the background of everything that I've done, right? So if you're a student at school, you're, you know, I played soccer, I did like a lot of other, other sports, but Krav Maga was always the one thing that defined me throughout the years. Mm -hmm. uh, I took a couple of breaks, you know, as a teenager, you always have like that, uh, like I want to be more social or I don't feel like doing that. And then um, 
when I uh, decided to kind of go back and like full on super serious with uh, my friend, um, my, my friend's name is Elad. He's, uh, he's the owner of uh, Krav Maga Academy in Israel, uh, the Israeli Krav Maga Academy. Um, and we just stuck with that together. You know, when you have a, a buddy, it's, uh, it's much easier to just stick with something. Um, and I was, again, fortunate to be trained by super legit people. Um, so, you know, uh, going through high school, that was one thing that definitely kept me, you know, always sharp um, and on point. And, um, and then I, you know, like, like everybody else in Israel, um, I was uh, drafted to the military um, throughout the military. The, the Krav Maga training in the military is a bit different, but, you know, than what needs to be done over there. Um, but I always knew that when I... When I get discharged, I'll go back to where I where I was, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we were a bunch of like great group of people uh, that uh, trained together. Right now, I think all the senior students from that school, have, you know, they have their own organizations now, and they are they have their own schools and they even affiliates. Um, everybody actually did very well. Um, so I have a tremendous respect to this this group that we all you know, kept each other like you know together. Um, mm. So then, through my twenties, uh, I trained. Uh, I, I I was fortunate to be trained with people that are extremely talented and extremely dedicated. For us, leaving craft was not even an option, right? Like you, you don't leave something that defines you. Right. Even when you have disagreements with the instructor or like how the school is ran or like, you know, everybody does it. In a, in a small school, there's always a lot of politics, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, it's in, in every school, not just small school. <laughs> um, because, you know, you know, everybody have their own ideas. And, uh, and when you are senior enough, you, you want to voice yourself, right? So um, even when, when I had different opinions than, uh, than how, you know, how the school should be ran, I never thought of that as an option not to be trained by my instructors because i thought that they are absolutely the best instructors in the world mm -hmm. right they they instilled the idea that the instructor is superman right <laughs> yeah and and that's uh that's that's an amazing job that they did um and uh, today i'm not, like the reason i'm saying that because today i, I find that a lot of people find Krav as a, like they want instant gratification, right? Like mm -hmm. if they don't get what they want, they don't get promoted to a new level or they don't get, you know, the, the, the schedule they want or anything in that, uh, you know, in that department, they feel like, ah, oh, you know what, I'll just like, go do something else or I, you know, I just leave it, right? And for me, it was not an option. Yeah. I just loved it too much, right? Like you don't stop doing something that defines you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that. I, I understand that I've been doing uh, martial arts since I was young as well. And yeah, every, everything that you just said also applies to every martial art. Um, but how prevalent is Krav Maga in, in Israel? Like both, like I know everyone does it in the military, but outside of the military, how, how prevalent is it? It's not other arts. No? No, it's not as, as well as I think, first, a lot of Israelis don't, know that Krav Maga is an Israeli thing. Really? Right? It's, like a, it's, it's not like a common knowledge. You'll be surprised, right? And and uh, Israelis are competitive people. And I think there's, I think, I believe, I mean, I you know, haven't been there in a long time like in, the, in, the, in the martial arts community there, but uh, jiu-jitsu and some like, like more competitive sports are very, very popular around there. Krav Maga is missing the, the competitive uh, element right and then many people that wanna they like to compare themselves right like they like you know like am i am i the best am i second to best like and then they need to know they're successful so right. oh my god is is lacking that that element for a good reason for a good reason yeah it's it's, it's not correct. it's not an it's not a sport <laughs> this is the yeah. reason you talk correctly then then it's not a big deal but yeah. when when uh, yeah, I think there's some 
some elements that can be improved upon, like with the message that Prabhu Maga has as a, as a system, Exactly, mm -hmm. and it's, it's very hard because there's nobody to control the message, right? Every school owner, every instructor, every student basically promote their own message. Yeah, yeah, it's it seems like it's very fragmented. Yeah, um, there's no one central or or even a consensus on the way things should be done. Um, so you you mentioned that the the Krav Maga and the military is different than. Um, the civilian Krav Maga, which, which we all know, but can you explain how your Krav Maga training in, in the military in Israel is different than the Krav Maga training that you had outside of the military in Israel? Yeah, I've been, I've been to two, uh, two different programs of Krav Maga in the military. One is a, as a paratrooper, um, and like in a, in a battalion, your, your job is not, it's not, I wasn't a commander. Right, so it's not like uh, you know kidnapping people and like all those mm -hmm. things that you see in uh, on Fawla. Um and so it it mostly was before Krav Maga was uh, was evolved even in the military. Um, mostly was like weapon striking, how to move from close range to a far further range, so you can use the the, the rifle as a warm weapon. Mm -hmm. um, so when what to do when you have malfunction and you have to move into Krav Maga um, and some really basic uh, com combatives. Um, so the technicality of, and the, the complexity of the, the training as a battalion soldier in the battalion was not extremely high, um, mm -hmm. because, also because it, it, you don't have a lot of time to train. Right? You have to squeeze in so many things to your day um, and uh, to your training period in general, and they just they give you whatever, like a couple of Pramaga hours a week. But different programs that I've done in uh, in a different uh, unit that I was at. Uh, so I took the counterterrorism uh, school, mm -hmm. the course in the counterterrorism school for mm -hmm. about seven weeks, and the Krav Maga was two hours a day, um, and that was a lot more intense. And the the contact level was just far more aggressive, and um, a lot more sparring, a lot more just like body conditioning and every aspect you can think of um, and a lot of mindset right mm -hmm. so fight through the pain you know through through exhaustion um, multiple attackers drills uh, weapon training that none of that was new to me except from the uh, you know for lack of a better term like so what if anybody got hurt yeah right like because in a civilian uh, environment you can't just do that right it's not it's not happening yeah, not not good for business. The um, so so basically, it sounds like um, that depending on what your job was in the military, the Krav Maga was different that they learned and more specific to the job. Is is that kind of the way it was? Yeah, it was more specific to the job because um, I, I was chosen to be in a like a dignitary protection unit. That I ended up eventually not not doing that, but I was trained um, to do that. Uh, and the, the the work is a, basically as a bodyguard. It's a very uh, exposed position. Right? Like you, you are the first and last. Well, you are not the first, but you are the last line of defense. So when you, when you need to fight, it means that so many other circles of security failed, and right. you're you're the last link. Okay, and and so. How is that different from the Krav Maga training that you had in like the studios that you went to? Um, the, the civilian Krav Maga has a lot more gray in it, right? The, the, the Krav Maga in the military has, is a kind of a black and white kind of thing. Like Krav Maga mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the military doesn't take enough and into consideration, um, you know, like this engagement with respect. Let's let's call it this way, right? Like you have to win, right? You're mm -hmm. not fighting, you're not fighting, uh, uh, you know, a, a person with a conflict. You're fighting someone who is uh, an enemy, mm -hmm. right? So you you have to to get to the point that you win. You you subdue them. Okay. And then the civilian side? 
the civilian side, you know, it, it's more about resolving conflict, right? Like if you have to fight, go ahead, fight and like do the absolute best you can to kick ass. But there is a lot of gray area of like when you can disengage, where where you can uh, you know stop stop fighting, right? So the the main rules we we had in the studio were like in Krav Maga there are more rules, but there are, there are two main guidelines, right? Do everything in your power not to get hurt, right? And use your knowledge according to your needs. So if you are able to disengage at any point with what we what we call uh, an honorable escape, mm -hmm. then and then you are uh, you know, that's where you stop. Mm. All right. And then so so you trained. Uh, to what level did you train in um, in Krav Maga in Israel before moving to the U.S.? Um, like uh, second degree black belt. Okay. All right. And and so you came to the U.S. and you did you start your studio right away, or were you still, or did you teach for someone else? Um, so it's it's, a, it's actually a good question. Um, I was under the impression, you know, that with my credentials that I come here and you know, find a job super easily, and and um, that was not the case. I honestly didn't know how. I think I just I was missing the cultural piece in, in the United States. Right? Mm -hmm. I, I assumed that what I bring with me is so awesome that you know I'll have, you know doors will will open, um, but they didn't. Right. And um, it was very humbling, right? So I realized that, like, I have to start from the very, very beginning, and I have to make that. I have to make myself, you know, to prove myself, because people here have no idea who I am. They don't care who I am, and it's it's on me to, to show them that I have the value that uh, they are they're looking for. Or, you know, I think Krav Maga was not even like um, uh, popular enough back then. So I had to show them that Krav Maga has value, and I am legit in teaching that. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, I went to like different gyms and like I, I was trying to promote private classes. I, I had absolutely no business experience whatsoever. My mom gave me 500 bucks and said, good luck. Uh, <laughs> and basically that was my, uh, my background in business. Mm -hmm. and, and I realized that um, I have to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And the rest is history, you know, like the, the, uh, people just started showing up, right? I started teaching people in the park. Um, one person became two, two became four, four became six, et cetera. And then, and very soon after I was able to hold a, a group hmm. uh, that we, I taught it for five, twice a week and then like four times a week. And then like more people started joining. Um, and, uh, the, you know, I had good enough, uh, followers that after a year, um, I rented a studio in New York city and I was pretty shocked. I remember the first time I had that conversation with the landlord about, uh, rent. <laughs> yeah. Rent in New York. <laughs> yeah. I was saying like, okay, this is the rent. It's like, you mean for months or a year? <laughs> because the, the monthly rent that he was asking me was more than what I used to get paid in a whole year in Israel. Yeah. And like, how am I going to do that? And said, you know what, you know, I, I'm going to make a plan. You know, I sat down with some numbers. I realized that I can make it happen if I, because I'm not afraid of the hard work, right? So if I, if I have more studio time, I'll make it happen so more people will come here. Yeah. Um, and that basically that was my plan. I refused to to take any loans or any investors because I, I knew that later down the, the, the road, you know, I don't want to owe anything to anybody. Um, and um, yeah, it just worked out well. And then people joined, uh, like more legit people also joined like and wanted to become part of, of what I do. They believed in my message. Um, nice. Soon after, I'd say like three years down the line, I already had uh, three locations in, uh, in New York, like one, one was like a full-time studio and two were like part-times. Mm -hmm. And four years later, I had, uh, we already had like three full-time locations and one part-time. Um, so things were just great, you know, staff was, uh, 
growing pretty quickly. You know, I had like 10 instructors at some point while working in the gym. Pre-COVID, I had, you know, pretty awesome thing going on. Um, and uh, now we have to like, you know, slowly get back to it. Um, but I am I know how to get there now, you know, I've done it once, I've done it twice. I know how to get there now. Uh, we have the, 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 our heart is in the right place. Okay. Yeah. And, and you know, we are, you know, we are known in New York to be the, the most premier school for self-defense and for problem God, you know, we've been working with, uh, a lot of television, a lot of movies, you know, train the Avengers and Olivia Wilde for a few movies. Okay. Uh, and a few other actors that I don't even remember their names because I know nothing about celebrities. <laughs> uh, nice. you know, it brings uh, it brings popularity to the school. It brings uh, you know, like it, it's a testament, right, to the level. Yeah, of yeah. I, I guess that would, that would definitely drive uh, more students in there to uh, train where celebrities trained. Um, so when you when you came over from from Israel and you and you and you started teaching here in North America, uh, did you, because you, you mentioned that uh, sometimes you didn't agree with the way studios were run um, by your instructors. What changes did you make when you came here to, uh, to North America and how are you teaching a little bit differently from Israel? So it's a, it's a, it's a very broad question. It's a great yeah. question. <laughs> that, that's alone, that, that alone is like a, another episode, but um, there, we go. Um, there were, I think I was uh, a little bit too arrogant when I was a teenager and I thought that I deserved more. Like I can see it in my students now, right? Like they're yeah. younger students or they're just, you know, they don't know how things are run, right? Or, you know, my instructors had like extremely high level of of commitment to what they teach, right? Mm -hmm. and, and to some of them, um, all of them were like the big names that you know right now. I just trying to not to mention the names of uh, individuals. Um, basically, all the the heads of uh, IKMF, right? Where I came. Mm -hmm. from. That's, that's that's where I grew up. I grew up with uh, under that umbrella, um, and. Um, there was like sometimes political decisions of like who is passing and who is not passing and who is testing and who is not testing. And I felt like I deserve more than what I have. Um, but, you know, now that, you know, I, I after I passed my uh, expert uh, test, I looked at that on the video and so like, oh, my God, I suck. <laughs> <laughs> I don't realize how much more there's to learn because everybody thinking, you know, when I reach a black belt, you know, this is the point that like, I know it all. Right. And it's only when you, you get to that peak and you see, oh my God, I actually know shit. Mm -hmm. There's so much more I need to know, so much more I need to learn. Like, I, I just need to like, humble myself, go back to learn, like, go back on the mat, shut up and just put the hours in. Um, because there's always someone that can humble you, right? And there's always stuff that you're not good at, right? You're great, good at striking, great. Now let's see how you're doing on the ground. If you're, you're uh, good on the ground, like, let's see how you're doing with, with combinations of, of striking and, and the ground. Let's see how you're good with weapons. Let's see how you're good with more like, uh, you know, advanced training with uh, applicable craft to, let's say, security or, or police, like more specifics, right? And there's still a difference between being an awesome trainee to an awesome trainer, right? right. So if you're good at, like, you, you move very nicely and, and uh, smoothly, great. Now work on your teaching skills. And vice versa, right? Like I believe that I'm a much better instructor than than a fighter. Right? Like I'm, I'm doing okay. I mean, I'm not. I, I don't think I'm I'm that horrible, but I feel like uh, I'm I'm a much better instructor than I am a fighter. Um, yeah. I I believe that I can make better fighters than I than myself. Right? Like I know, and that's the, that's that leads me to the second part of your question of like what kind of changes you made. Because the way I learned craft was. Uh, almost like memorizing the, mm -hmm. the techniques. Um, and it was not like based on just principles. Right. And in 2010, Gabi uh, and I sat for, I'd say close to 400 hours uh, writing a new curriculum. Um, and his idea 
was to create a curriculum that first you nail down the basics, the fundamentals, mm -hmm. and, and then you build up the, the more advanced techniques, right? So don't expect people to perform extremely well when they don't get the, the, the basics down, right? right? And I gotta say that first, I, uh, I didn't like the idea, right? Because I told them like, I am the product of that old curriculum that I came at that. And I turned out okay. okay. Yeah. And um, he said, trust me, you do this right and your students will become a lot better. And he was right, 100%. Like, you know, in a matter of like three weeks, I noticed the difference already between mm -hmm. the new guys that were trained under the new curriculum and the older guys that trained under the old curriculum and the new guys get just got it a lot better. Mm -hmm. So he's absolutely right about it. Um, but I, uh, I had, you know, other views of like to how a brand should be um, ran and, and you know, presented. And also I think, you know, we used to think that Krav Maga is like a one-stop shop, but no art is a one-stop shop. No art is a one-stop shop at all, right? So there's always a lot more to learn. And um, so I started implementing more like ground fighting as an extracurricular classes, not as part of Krav Maga classes but extracurricular classes, because sometimes, you know, you don't want you, you want to maintain that game element on the, on the ground, but you, you don't want to hurt someone. Right. Because in crowd, the solution is like, go bam, bang them like in the face, or like give them a, a groin shot or poke their eyes or do something dirty, and get up and you don't want to do that with a friend, right? So you end up feeling like you're failing on the ground, where in fact, you're not failing, you just, you, you can't, you can't do the techniques you know. And the same thing, you know, like the, the ground is actually a great, it's a great example to, to many of the, the deficits we have because there are many things in crop that we, when we train them in, in training, the, the attacker is compliant and then, then the technique works, no problem, right? And, but then you create a, a forced sense of confidence. Right. And then when that advanced students who work so many times with someone who's as compliant, get their ass kicked by uh, someone who trained jiu-jitsu for like four weeks, right? Because they are not compliant, right? So that's where I started implementing more in between situations. And then I borrowed things that um, helped us to go back to the basics of movements, right? I created like the, the kind of the fight stance on the ground, the, the basic movements on the ground. So I created a whole new ground curriculum that would be aligned with Krav Maga principles. Um, and in addition to the, the ground fighting, the, your body as a whole needs a lot more than just fighting, right? So the, it's great that you know how to fight, but the question, can you, can you train uh, for a long time without injuring yourself, right? So we have to, to add more knowledge as instructors. We have to learn more of how to prevent mm -hmm. injuries and how to increase range of motion and not just uh, muscle flexibility. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of even stretches that are outdated that, that you know, we've proven that are hurting the, the joints, hurting the muscles and, and shouldn't be done, right? So it's, it's on us as uh, instructors to provide the knowledge, right? Like it's on us to keep, to keep on learning because yeah. it, it's not a, being an instructor is not an end goal, it's a beginning. Mm -hmm. right? And now you really have to up your game and, and make sure that you know at least, at least one step ahead of your students, you know, in, in every aspect of your body. Um, so I implemented a lot of mobility training into, uh, into the training, like as, as a part of the warm up. Right. And so then we see people that increasing range of motion in, with their hips and with your uh, thoracic spine. Um, and, and that decreases a lot, uh, the injuries that, that occur commonly in, in training. Right, because when you're like doing this all the time, then you have to counter the pose eventually with, with an opener. Yeah. Right. So you, if you log in so many hours of doing this, you know, your shoulders would just stay in that position. Um, it look like an old lady. Yeah. The, uh, um, yeah. No, you're 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 absolutely right. There, there's a huge difference between being, um, I guess, for lack of a better term, the the student or the athlete, the student, and versus the instructor. Um, and all the great athletes, right, 
uh, for the most part, their their instructors could never do what the athlete accomplished, right? Correct. So, you, like you have like Mike Tyson. We know that his uh, his coach could not do <laughs> what Mike Tyson did, right? But without the coach, because uh, as the coach, you you need to understand the technique much more intimately than the uh, than the actual student does yeah. because so the student really only needs to know that it works you as a coach you need to know why it works and I know that sometimes and and this has been my experience in the past that um, the person that's the best at something isn't necessarily always the best at teaching it mm -hmm. Right. And I think that uh, it's rare if you get someone that is really, really good at uh, performing and also an amazing coach. Right. Yeah. So mo most people are really proficient at at, uh, at at doing what they do, but then they can also be amazing coaches, too. Um, so what are what are some of the the basic principles that you guys hashed out um, that you would teach like someone brand new coming in? So I believe, so two things. First, you, know, you, you also asked me, um, you know, in the, in the questions, you, the list of questions mm -hmm. you sent me about the, the philosophy. So th this is where the philosophy starts, right? The philosophy starts with the Krav Maga is a system that meets the individual and not the other way around right it's mm -hmm. not like a traditional art that you come into the school and you have to learn the katas and you have to learn like, the movements and like and, and this is how you advance right krav maga meets you where you are right and not everybody is going to be able to do to, to get to the same level at the end of it right mm -hmm. so people are just you know their their max level would be maybe you know below what another person's pre-training level but the, what we need to look at is like how far we can get them from where they are to a new place, right? To a better place. Um, and that, you know, some people, it may, it may take a long time. Um, and they are never going to be awesome, but they're going to be a lot better than before. Right. Um, and, and, and that's our job. It's, it, I find it, it's almost like a kind of trial of therapy, right? Because um, eventually you need to improve their, their lifestyle altogether. Right? And you need to make them love what they do and feel empowered. And once they do that, once they feel empowered, they are free to make decisions, right? I believe that in a nutshell, uh, the philosophy is that I give people the power to make a decision. Mm -hmm. right? like, because when you have a decision, you don't feel like you're uh, you know, pushed to the corner uh, in, in a physical way and also in a, in a mental way, right? You, you have more options here in the toolbox, then you're better off, right? When you, when you have, all you have is a hammer, every problem is a nail. Yeah, exactly. And, and uh, mostly I find with women, but it also happens with some men, that uh, we need to teach boundaries, right? To, to understand, that's what I, I teach my own kids, right? Since they're 14 months old. <laughs> what, what, what is it that makes you feel uncomfortable? Right. right? If you know what, what to define what makes you feel uncomfortable, you know what you need to protect. Right? Mm -hmm. When I say keep your hands up, I'm not really asking you to protect your face. I am asking you to protect your face, but if you, this is also hands up and this is not protecting your face. Mm -hmm. This is also hands up, but it's not protecting your face, right? So you need to, to show me what is it that you need to protect, right? So if, if you are too close to me, I, I failed at keeping the distance, right? So I, I feel more comfortable when you're there, right? Like at that distance, arm distance. Mm -hmm. It means that that's what I need to protect. That's where I'm going to keep my hands, right? So a create a visible boundary, right? If you know that someone getting too close to you makes you feel uncomfortable, so protect that plan. Don't protect your face because then he, you basically this, you're showing them, you're inviting them to intrude to your personal space. It's like, you can come all the way up to here. That's fine. Mm -hmm. We can start. We can start the negotiation from here. So no, you keep the negotiation to start from here. You cross that line, you get clocked. That that's the deal. Mm -hmm. All right. So that the definition of of what makes you feel uncomfortable, and then how you reinforce your boundaries, right? Because once you know you know that you don't want to be too close to you, right? You don't know me. 
you don't want me too close to you, I crossed your line and went in, into your personal space. Mm -hmm. Naturally, most people will choose the option of retreating because we are polite and we are civilized, right? right? But then if I cross that line again, and you went back again, without asserting yourself, I'm not saying necessarily physically, but asserting yourself at least with your words. Mm -hmm. right? they are in, even in, in Krav Maga, and although we are doing physical techniques, a lot of that is just you know maintaining maintaining distance, right, and, and mm -hmm. trying to avoid a fight. So once I went in again, and you went back again, you were treated. You taught me now something very very important. You taught me that it's okay to do it again. Yeah. So this is where like, excuse me, you're too close. Use your voice, right? Like that's something that is that simple that could probably save your day if you just do it there, right? Like, and, and the longer you wait on, on that timeline, the more advanced technique you will need to use at the end of it, right? So if you, if you master your, the basics, you're never gonna need the more advanced techniques. Yeah, so it's, it's like a preemptive um, philosophy where um, if by the time you're doing a self-defense technique, it's already too late. A lot, a lot of stuff went wrong for you to end up in, in that position. Yeah, um, but then I have, you know, I, I, I have a quote, you know, that someone quoted me once on that on the shirt, it was funny. It's like, if you have to fight, you have to win. Yeah. That's as simple as that, right? So we're trying to avoid fight by all, all means, you know, all cost. Um, yeah. But if we fail, if diplomacy failed, you better do it quickly. Yeah, and and I and I think that's important lesson to teach because um, especially in culture like culture like uh, like in our society, um, women are conditioned to accept more of that um, violation of their boundaries than than men do, right? That's so. Funny. Yeah, so men are more likely to punch another guy that uh, that crosses the boundary where women are taught to be more submissive, and and I think that uh, that yeah, you you need they need, we need to teach that everybody that no, you you draw your your line where you're comfortable and you make sure that the other person uh, abides by it. No one has the right to to violate that. Yeah. All right. Um, so. You s how many how many locations do you have now? So currently, two locations are open. Um, we'll see what happens, you know, in a few months mm -hmm. uh, post COVID. But uh, right now, you know, we are being careful with reopening more because you know if there's like a new variant or anything like that, you know, but you 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 can't be too careful right now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we don't want things to be shut down again. Yeah. Um, so if if people want to uh, reach out and um, train with you, uh, especially in the New York area, where what's the best way to get into contact with you? So, you know, our website is problemagaiexperts.com and mm -hmm. you know, we have uh, our social media accounts, like Facebook and, and Instagram, both are problemagaiexperts, uh, like at problemagaiexperts. Um, it's very easy. Super easy to find us when you Google that. The uh, email address is info at chromagaiexperts.com. So that like the branding is pretty simple to follow. Uh, and uh, you know, we, we communicate mostly through social media. Okay. And, um, yeah, so anybody that uh, want to find me, it's super easy. Okay, perfect. Well, we'll, po we'll post that underneath the, uh, the interview so that uh, so that people can uh, can navigate uh, and get in contact with you. Well, it's been uh, awesome. I loved our discussion. Um, hopefully, uh, you can come back on, and then we, we can do a whole business one <laughs> that you were talking about there. That would be interesting too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, th thank you for coming on to Crop Life, and um, you have yourself a, a great day. Thank you. I'll see you. See you next time. Take care. See you.